All right, Mike. You sent me a picture, and you had a caption underneath of it that said, this is your fault. And I have to admit, I don't feel bad, (laughs) given the number of things that you have sent to me. And I have to tell you, this is your fault. (laughs) But you sent me a picture of a notebook with a fountain pen in it. I did. And I got super, super excited. (laughs) Yeah, the gift you sent me was pretty awesome. I showed that to Rachel. (laughs) She thought that was funny. Yes. So what? what? What is going on? Why? What happened? I'm excited. Tell me all the stuffs. I have a fancy fountain pen, and it's not as fancy as probably many of yours, but it is... Uh, it's fairly fancy. I've heard you talk about it forever. I've heard David Sparks talk about it forever. I shared an Uber with Brad Doughty, the pen addict, and all of those seeds that have been planted have manifested into a Schaefer 300 fountain pen. I walked into Anderson Pens in Appleton, Wisconsin. I said, I need a fancy fountain pen for someone who has never had a fountain pen before. They showed me the really cheap ones. They showed me the next step up. And uh, yeah, I walked out with a pen and a notebook and a lot less money in my wallet. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. What's the what's the notebook? You said it was a Schaefer 300, but what's the notebook? Well, I remember you were a big fan of the like term, so I have a like term, but I've actually nice. set that aside. I don't really like the the ghosting, I think it's called, or, or no, oh, feathering. Sure. feathering. I'm, I'm still new to all these terms, okay. but uh, there's a little bit too much feathering for me with the, uh, with the Schaefer. I went home and tried a Baron Fig. That seemed to be a little bit better, and I have one of these James Clear Baron Fig versions that I bought a long time ago just because I wanted to see all of the additional stuff that he put inside of the notebook. Never really intended to use it, but it does have a really cool cover. And once I decided that the Baron Fig paper was the one that I liked out of the stuff that I had accessible to me, I decided to use this. Uh, I've also got a Rodeo web notebook. I bought one off of Amazon, a bigger one, because I wanted to experiment with the larger size. I know that there's a larger version of this James Clear Baron Fig. That's probably the one that I'm going to use going forward just because I like the way that it looks. Sure. And I like the feel of the Schaefer 300 on the Baron Fig paper. And the way I'm using this, uh, which is really probably what people actually care about, (laughs) is uh, I wanted to rethink how I plan my day. I talked a little bit about this on the latest episode of Focused. So I won't retell the whole thing. But um, basically what was happening was I was trying to fill out my custom good notes template at the very end of my day, or if I didn't get to it, the very beginning of my day. And I found that I was waking up in the morning. hadn't done If I hadn't done it the night before, I was just completely skipping over it and just entering right into my work. And I'm like, I know that I should be doing this. And why am I not doing this basically? And uh, I realized that it was because there is, um, it doesn't take me that long. It takes me like five minutes, but by the time I fill it out, it's like that is going to be wrong. And because I was, I was trying to position that as my plan for the day, I was getting kind of frustrated that it was so wrong so often. So what I've started to do is incorporate a new shutdown routine where I actually fill out that template as the last thing I do during my work day, the day before. So like four or five o'clock, that's when I fill out the GoodNotes template. It still just takes five minutes. And then when I wake up in the morning, I look at that. I also check Basecamp to see if anything that the team needs, uh, see if that kind of reach, changes how, how I need to think about my day. And then I just write down three things that I want to do today. It's a very, very simple list, but it's almost like because I did the plan the night before, it gives, it it allows me to be wrong. (laughs) It allows me to just chuck it. (laughs) Right. Uh, It's it's almost like the value associated with that now is clearing my brain at the end of the day instead of trying to articulate a a clear plan for the next day. And that has that has stuck. Other than me being sick for about a week and not doing (laughs) any of this, uh, it's been it's been really great. And then what I also find is like once I have that the three things for the day that I, I work off of on the, the simple 
simple checklist. I also am liking just kind of doodling and thinking through my pen, you know, on the the rest of the the pages there. So as I think about, you know, different, different things that I want to do, or maybe there's like different angles I want to consider for uh, an app review or an article I want to write or how I want to reposition some things that has been really great because it forces me to move more slowly than anything digital. So I, I really like that. Well, welcome to the dark side of analog. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It can get expensive quickly. That's <laughs> <laughs> what some, I hear. Some people talk about how like all the task management apps and such can get expensive when you're trying to like explore them and figure out which one works best for you. But it's nothing compared to fountain pens. It doesn't even scratch the surface compared to the analog side of things cuz th- just the sheer volume of notebooks and pens and things that you you can't I mean you can do this cheap. I mean you can do it with a big pen and a notepad from a hotel. Like you can do that. But why would you do that? <laughs> so yes, I, I I'm happy to have you on my side of things now, Mike. Makes me happy. <laughs> Speaking of analog productivity stuff, there's something else I want to mention here. Uh, David and I recorded an episode of Focused on Calendars. That episode, I was really happy with the way it turned out. We also made an announcement in that episode. We have a custom branded Focused New Year calendar. Are you familiar with New Year, Joe? I am. These are pretty cool calendars. They are. I've used one of these the last several years. I don't even remember how long I've, I've had these, probably five or six years at least. And it's a wall calendar that shows the whole year at a glance, but instead of having like 12 different boxes for the months, they kind of all run together. So you can see how things tie together. It just gives you a more cohesive view of your entire year. And we've got a focus branded one with a couple touches on there that are additional features, basically. So in addition to the the cool looking focus logo in the, the top, in the tagline, uh, it's got shading behind the different quarters. So you can kind of at a glance, see your 12 week year. If you wanted to use that sort of framework or like the personal retreat framework, for example, it's, it's perfect for implementing something like that. Cause you can kind of see where your deadlines line up in terms of your, your 12 week year and all the other things that you would want to put on there. There's a key at the bottom that you can color code, which if you're going to follow the 12 week year and you're going to build out the habits, that's a really effective way to, to track that sort of stuff. I use mine just as like a big picture sort of thing where I've got all the the big stuff for the year on that uh, that I'm going to be doing. So I've got like the Relay 5 year anniversary thing that I went to, Mac stock, sabbaticals, speech contests, all, all that type of stuff. So I can kind of see a landscape of my year. And I can see that, you know, in, in June, for example, I was at Craft and Commerce and less than a week later, I get back and I'm going to Costa Rica on a missions trip. So if somebody wants me to do something in June, <laughs> it's right by my desk. I just look at that and, oh, nope, that's not a good idea. <laughs> I got a lot going on. Uh, so these calendars, I'm really happy with the way that they they turned out. They are $29. We'll put the link in the show notes for anybody who wants to get one. And that $29 actually includes free shipping. So it's flat $29 if you're going to buy it and get it shipped somewhere in the, the US. I'm not sure what the shipping would be if you live outside the US. Sorry about that. Gosh, Mike, can't do free shipping to anywhere in the world. I feel like that would be <laughs> nope. really expensive to do. Calendars are kind of tricky to ship. They come in these big tubes. <laughs> but Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'm glad I don't have to figure that part out. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I'm looking through our follow-up list. We got the pins, we got the calendar. Ooh, you did something fun. I did. I mentioned a while ago, one of my gap books was Tools and Weapons by Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft. And I was walking through Appleton uh, the other day, and I cut through the local university, and they have this campus center. And uh, I was I took the long way back, basically, from the coffee shop that I like to, to work from, cut through this campus center and saw this sign that said that the author, Brad Smith, was going to be speaking at the university in like five days. So I actually signed up. It was free to go to, and I saw him talk about his book, which was really interesting. It's, it's kind of cool. The the book itself talks about the role of data in the 
in the the economy going forward and basically how that's the thing that's so valuable and how it can be used for good or it could be used for evil. And it's kind of interesting some of the things that Microsoft specifically, because he's the president of Microsoft, has done in terms of protecting people's data. Like he talked about how it's going to change the way that people work, but maybe not necessarily in a bad way. So, for example, he has a chapter in the book about the day the horses lost their jobs. And the story he tells is how they had this last run of the New York City Fire Department when they retired the horses and they switched over to the the, the gasoline engines for the, the trucks. And how that actually had a lot of economic implications because a lot of the farmers that were producing crops were producing a lot of hay. Now there were less horses. They couldn't produce as much hay. They tried to produce more tobacco and wheat and things like that the but there there wasn't that much demand for those things and so the the farmers felt it negatively and then people made the argument Brad Smith didn't that you know the the rural banks did they they would did poorly because the farmers did poorly and then the bigger banks and that kind of was an accelerant to the whole great depression i don't know how true that part actually is but the thing that came out of that was the automobile industry and how it actually created a lot of jobs. So it was a really eye-opening book because he talks about this going forward and how data is going to eliminate a lot of the jobs that that exist currently. But that doesn't mean there's going to be less jobs. It just means that you kind of have to rethink our, our skill sets and then also all the ethical implications of, of uh, controlling all this data. He mentioned that Microsoft has gotten approached by countries <laughs> where they're dictators and they want to use facial recognition and all this to like control the population and gather all this data. And Microsoft's just like, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but it's kind of scary because there are companies that will be will do that. You know, they, they're not going to draw the line there. So it's uh, it's not something that has an easy answer. Like this is wrong. This is right. You know, it's still something that people need to figure out. And it was kind of interesting to hear him talk about some of the ways that Microsoft is trying to handle those questions in an ethical manner. Um, but yeah, it was, it was really good. I didn't get to, to meet him personally, but I did get to see him speak. I was about nice. 15 feet away from him. So that was fun. Hi, Brad. <laughs> cool. For the listeners, you've probably picked up by now, Mike and I might sound a little funny. And it's because mostly due to me, we put the show off a week and it's primarily because I've had a cold so bad I haven't been able to talk. Mike has had some similar scenario as well, and we're kind of still coming out of it, so we're going to power through today and do our best with reviewing today's book, which is kind of ironic (laughs) given our health state right now. But before I do that, I want to... A bit of a game of sorts with uh, the members, especially those who are listening live, but... Something we usually do is we pick books from the recommendations list. And I'm not really sure why I came up with this idea, Mike, and I haven't even run it by Mike. So this is news to Mike as well. But I have my book picked for the next round that I have. So Mike's book is next. Mine following that I have selected. But the one that I'm going to choose following that one, I want to come direct one-on-one from a member. So here's 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 how this works. The very first member who sends me a private message on the Bookworm Club, send me the one book you want to hear us cover, and I will pick that book. Like Oh boy. Number one, you have to be a member and you have to be the first one to send me a private message. Like that's 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 all I'm saying. Okay. Leading into today's book. And the reason I was saying it's a bit ironic that we're covering this, Super Better by Jane McGonigal. Uh, Tagline on this is a revolutionary approach to getting stronger, happier, braver, and more resilient. And uh, has an asterisk powered by the science of games. And you you need to know that Jane McGonigal has a PhD in the science of gaming and how the benefits and detriments of gaming on your brain and your your social status, your relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And she had a bit of a crisis herself in that she had a concussion. I don't think she ever said how she got the concussion, just that she had a pretty severe concussion and that she 
in the process of healing, it took her, I think it was a little over a year to fully heal from that. But she developed this game called Super Better to help her through the process of healing from that concussion. And that is what became this book that we're covering today, Super Better. This is a book about that game and how you can apply it to your life as well. Uh, it's a fascinating read. I was not real sure what to expect when I picked it up. I didn't realize that Super Better was the name of a game. Uh, so you can play Super Better. But it's a fascinating read, I felt, anyway. What were your initial thoughts on it, Mike? I, I really enjoyed the book overall. Uh, her story was really interesting. I also have had a concussion, so I know a little bit of what she's dealing with, although her symptoms were way worse than, than mine. I didn't even know I had a concussion until I went into the, the doctor because my headaches kept getting worse. But um, she was in a pretty dark place, and so it's kind of cool how she used this whole idea of um, i guess gamification to uh to kind of turn her life around she was dealing with suicidal ideation and she said in the introduction to the book that basically she was going to either end up killing herself or she was going to have to beat this and the way that she did that was by treating it as a game i think the method that she used is really cool i like the the kind of the seven steps or the seven rules that she outlines in the book. I did look at the super better app, like right at the beginning. And I have to admit that I don't think I'm going to be using this app, but no elements of this. I, I definitely want to apply. You should know the app was sold off recently. And I think it was about a year ago. Cause I think this was written what 2014, 15, but the app is under new ownership, so it's not under Jane's company anymore. It's its own thing. So just be aware of that. Okay. Well, the app itself is pretty horrible on an iPhone anyways. <laughs> I'm trying to look at when it was last updated. And it says five months ago, but the like you open it up, and the keyboard doesn't even look right. It looks like an iPhone 5 size uh, <laughs> size interface. Um, so right away, I knew I wasn't going to follow that method. But I really think you don't need to. I think there's a lot in this book that you can you can take and apply without actually joining the super better community. Although she does, the, the way it's written, you know, obviously... That's it's kind of a sales pitch for for that program, I guess, maybe is the better way to to frame it. But it's not I wouldn't say it's explicit. Like it's it's hard to catch that. Correct. But she's talking about her story and then she talks about other people who have gone through it and there's a lot of those stories in here. And she she does mention you, know, you can use use this, join the community, yada 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 throughout. So I had a little bit of trouble figuring out how I was going to do that in a non superbetter.com way. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, let's let's run through the book cuz I'm sure more of that will come out as we go, especially once we get down towards the end of some of this. But again, this is a book in three parts as they all do. Well, I shouldn't say they all do. 99.99% of these books are three parts. Uh, part one, why games make us super better. Part two is how to be gameful. And then part three is adventures. So let's start with part one, which is basically any and all science you can come up with that show the benefit of playing games, whether it's video games, board games, card games, etc. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, what What are the aspects of games that can be applied to real life? I can't say there's anything just super groundbreaking in this particular part that stood out to me other than the one point that she makes about, because you see the science that says, gaming is ruining our children. And on the other side of the coin, you'll see things where it's like, Games are helping people increase their willpower. Like you see these studies that seem to be contradicting each other back and forth. And she 
she goes into why some of that is is uh, at odds with each other. The primary being, what is the intent of you playing that game? And the negative side of it is, if you're using that game, especially video games, as an escape from the real world, that's when the negative detriments tend to come out. On the flip side of that is if you are using the game to connect with other people in real life, whether it's via virtual uh, communication uh, or it's in person, whether you're playing the game with someone sitting right next to you, whenever you do it in that form, that's when the benefits of playing these video games comes out. So just be aware that there are, she does call out the the difference between uh, the science that shows like, games are horrible and games are amazing. Like she does at least address that. Yeah. The first chapter was interesting. She talks a lot about PTSD and specifically burn victims. And uh, she uses a lot of stories like this, but I'll just tell this, this one as an example. She mentions that people who have severe burns, she makes the statement that nothing is more painful than a severe burn. And the traditional treatment for a severe burn is morphine. But what they did is they had a virtual reality game called Snow World, which actually proved to be better than the morphine by about 30 to 50% in terms of helping people deal with the pain. It allowed the players to kind of forget about their burns for a little while. So escaping reality in one sense for the average person is probably not a great goal. But if you are trying to overcome a specific medical condition, like a severe burn, it can actually be used in a positive way like that. And it really just shows that you're not powerless against your pain signals. You can do something about them. You have to learn to take your attention and put it on something else. I think she calls that spotlighting. I'm trying to Yes. Scroll yep. through my mind node file here. It's pretty huge for this particular <laughs> book because it's a pretty long book. Yeah, it is. But I think that's a really cool idea and it's something that anybody could uh, could implement. Uh, another example from that first chapter was the whole idea of playing Tetris for a couple of minutes. It doesn't have to be Tetris specifically, but it does have to be the type of game where you're doing a massive amount of constant visual processing. How if you play Tetris for a couple of minutes when you're experiencing a craving, then you can reduce that craving by up to 25%. That was really interesting in a smaller version, maybe of the the spotlighting that maybe is more practical for people who, you know, you're trying to quit smoking, for example, and you feel the urge to have a cigarette, play Tetris for a couple of minutes and see if it goes away. That's kind of a, a cool strategy, I think. It's a fun way to bring games into dealing with addictions. <laughs> sure. Yep. She does have a lot of stories about you know how games are used to uh, uh, apply to difficult situations. Uh, she also spells out some that are very positive, like how dads uh, will get into gaming with their sons or their daughters as a way to to build their relationship with them. And like I I could see a lot of potential value in that. As someone who is far from a video gamer, I've never been into video gaming really in any way, shape, or form. Like I, I don't know that I'm going to get into video gaming, but I at least have a better perspective on those who do and, and feel like I can at least converse with folks who do. So there's that. It at least gave me a terminology. Sure. Well, I really like the idea of gaming together, but not just video games. Uh, the the thing that happens, whether you're playing a video game or an actual game, she kind of talks about in chapter two, which is the mirroring or the mimicking. You kind of like match up with the person that you're playing with. An example of this could be you're walking next to somebody down the sidewalk and eventually you will sync up and your your steps will kind of match as you're walking in together and maybe you're talking. I have seen that happen and didn't really realize that's what was happening, but that's what happens. And when you play a game with somebody, that's kind of the same thing kind of happens. So actually, since I read this, 
we've had an opportunity because I haven't been feeling well and I've been home a lot. And uh, we've played several games as a, a family in the last week and a half or so. And uh, it's it's been fun. I can see now, having read this book, how that does actually help strengthen the relationships. But I also noticed that I have to approach it the right way. So in the past, I especially when playing with my family, it's kind of difficult because we've got a couple kids who are older and they like to play the more in-depth games and then some younger ones who can't do that, right? So there's a balance there between the older ones being bored with something like Sorry and the younger ones like completely destroying something like Castles of Mad King Ludwig, <laughs> right? Sure, sure. And uh, what that has caused me to do by default is I get focused on like trying to prevent people from messing up the game as opposed to entering in and enjoying the game. And that's something that I've been working on as we played several games recently. And I guess I'm noticing that I'm getting better at this, where if I were to sit down with you and Josh and maybe somebody else who are playing a board game as adults, it probably is a lot easier for me to just enjoy the game, right? But I have to work at that when I'm playing the game with my kids in order to protect the benefits, the sinking benefits that can can happen there. I guess kind of when I started doing this, I was realizing that, yeah, I was playing the games, but I wasn't doing it right. <laughs> sure. So I've kind of modified that a little bit, kind of loosened up a little bit. <laughs> and uh, it's been a lot more enjoyable because of that. Good for you. So see, now you can get super better at playing games. Good job, Mike. It is it is fun. And it's interesting to see how it impacts my kids by the time that we're, we're done. I've kind of approached the last couple of games that we've played that way, where I've kept an eye out for what are their facial expressions or how are they acting by the time the game is done, whether or not they end up winning or, or doing well. And it's been it's been interesting because what happens is like my my oldest son is a lot like me and he doesn't like to lose, <laughs> right? Sure, sure. And the first time that we played a game after I read this book and he didn't do well, I noticed he was a little bit frustrated or aggravated. But also that was the one where I recognized that I was more so trying to keep everybody else away from the game so we could actually play it. And I wasn't really engaged in the game itself. And then several times since then we've played. And if I can cut through all of the the noise that's happening around us and I can just focus on enjoying the game, that has an impact in my kids. Where even if I trounce him in <laughs> in castles you know he's still like he has it's hard to explain but it's like there's a joy there that wasn't there because of the way the game was played and it's kind of sobering to recognize that as the adult i have the ability to control that sure. and the responsibility i would say yeah so don't mess it up dad <laughs> yeah be good dad make, make it good for everybody i totally get that I mean, we don't do a ton of games. We've been doing it more in last year or so, but the girls have a few smaller kid-like board games that we play uh, once in a while. And if I get super into it, like they get super into it. Uh, and the more fun I have with it, the more fun they have with it. So yeah, I can totally see how like your perspective on it goes a very long ways, especially with children, for sure let's let's step into part two here mike of how to be gameful i feel like there's a lot of things we could continue talking about like the fun of games and the science behind it. i think maybe going through what super better is and like how that builds out is, uh would be a good next step unless there's something specific you want to cover more on part one no we can go into part two but i will say that the thing that stands out to me from part one is that games are a 
relationship building tool. And so that's where one of my action items sure. comes from. I don't want to have a specific day of the week necessarily be like a, we're going to play games on this day, but I do want to start having more family game nights like that. Play with purpose is kind of the, the thing I wrote down here. And yeah. it could be, you know, we, they love it when we play Mario Kart on the switch as a family too. And we just, you know, keep rotating. It could be board games, but that's something that I want to do more of because when you play a game, you do have a broad range of emotional reactions. You have to you have to deal with frustration and anxiety when you're not doing well. And I she talks about that in, in chapter four. But uh, I, I feel like there's a lot of benefit from that. I feel like this is something that can draw draw us closer together as a, a family. And so I want to, I want to use this more frequently when, instead of just, you know, putting on a movie or whatever, we're being more intentional and in, in uh, playing games. Sure. No, it makes a lot of sense. So let's step into what is super better. The, the game itself, how to be gameful. And there are seven rules that come with this particular game. We'll go through each one of these uh, and, and some of them will be quick. Some of them will probably spend a little more time on because some of them I feel like are, you know, pretty minor. It's like once you understand it, well, that's it, that's it, and it's done. Yep. Um, the first of this, well, let me just run through. Here's what the seven are: challenge yourself, power ups, bad guys, quests, allies, your secret identity, and epic wins. So those are the seven. So the first one of those is challenge yourself and. I mean, this is basically the purpose of the game. Like, what is it that you're trying to become super better at? And she clarifies the difference between getting super better at something as opposed to getting super better from something. Uh, And, and like, personally, whenever I was going through this particular chapter, it's like, well, what is my challenge? Like, it's, it's pretty obvious for me is like I need to try to beat Lyme disease and recently I found out I have a mold infection as well great fun so basically I have a lot of health issues and it would be very easy for me to take what she says here is like oh yeah I need to get super better from Lyme disease no that's that's not the point because what you're doing there is you're saying that you're making the negative part of your whole challenge as opposed to shooting to become super better at being healthy. Like that's a very different perspective because you're focusing on the positive side of it. And that focus on the negative or the positive is extremely important for your mental state as to how you go through the rest of the game. Just like what you were talking about, Mike, with the kids, like they pick up your negative or your mental or your positive mental state, like on how you're approaching the game. This is the same thing just with yourself you have to be focused on the the right side of it. Otherwise, the whole time you're just focusing on the the bad parts of what you're dealing with, and the whole thing can become negative in itself. Yeah, the the challenges that you face when you apply a a gameful approach to them, they become more fun and engaging instead of oh, I wish this wasn't happening to me. Basically, right, right. Because with the game you volunteer to be challenged and you can apply that mindset even if you're facing something that you didn't really sign up for by applying the gameful approach you basically put yourself in a position where you're more motivated to overcome it which is kind of the author's story from the the very beginning you can turn anxiety into emotion into a excitement through a process she calls cognitive reappraisal where it's you, how you change, how you think, or you feel about a stressful problem in your life. This is something that I struggle with. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's as simple as she makes it sound. <laughs> but basically, when you find yourself being anxious about something, she's saying, "Tell yourself, get excited," because physiologically they're the same emotion. And when you feel anxious, it's easier to get excited than it is to calm down. I haven't really had an opportunity to try this. Ha- have you done anything with this? I did it right before we started recording. Okay. So how's it working? <laughs> it's helped me. I mean, I was ready to go lay down before I got started here. So by saying, hey, let's get excited about recording Bookworm, 
You know, my voice isn't necessarily there, but I feel like my mental state's fine. Sure. Whereas, you know, 30, 40 minutes ago, I was ready for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could take a nap too. <laughs> uh, I guess the the way it's, she describes it, though, I feel like maybe, okay, so maybe I do this a little bit already, but I think that just saying I'm anxious about this thing and instead I'm going to be excited, that doesn't seem to jive real well with me. Maybe that just shows that I really need to do this, though. <laughs> yeah, because I, I had the same reaction to that. It's like, I, brr, I'm i not one that's going to make that move. Like, I'm, I'm just not one that seems to, like, this is horrible for me. I'm going to turn it for good. I'm like, no, nope, it's still horrible. Like, it's just going to be that way. Like, I kind of had that uh, thought when I, I first went through it, which... I, I'm with you. Like, I, it just doesn't seem right. But the more times I think about it and have marinated on that concept, the more I realize it's probably spot on. Of, I I have to let go of that negative thinking in order to get past. So much of this book is how you think. Yep. Which I wasn't really expecting. I guess I don't know what I was expecting, but it, it's it's so much about your perspective and how you view things as opposed to the things you physically do. I think this is the same thing here, Mike. Like it's, yes, you may be anxious about something, but being willing to try to turn it on its head, get excited about it, use the same physiological response of anxiety, which corresponds to excitement, like just switching your view on that. I I feel it could be helpful. I haven't specifically done that itself. But I, I mean, I can't refute it either. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've kind of done this with Toastmasters and I have told this story many times, but I was just like everybody else the first time that I went and was terrified of getting up and speaking in front of somebody. But the more that I did it, the more I realized that that's actually something I really enjoy. Doesn't mean I don't get nervous or anxious I've just done it enough where I know what the end result is going to be now. And so I look forward to it almost instead of appre- approaching it apprehensively. So that mindset shift kind of happens there, but it's not something that I tell myself before I get up to give a speech. Okay, you're really anxious right now. So instead, be excited about this. It just kind of happens. I don't know. And I, I, I have trouble believing that the act of saying, okay, I'm going to get excited about this instead is enough to make it go from negative to positive. But I haven't really been able to test that either. So I figure it can't hurt. <laughs> no, it can't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if you've got to do it anyways. Yep. Yep, for sure. So the purpose of this chapter is choose to be gameful about something that you want to become super better at with health. And, you know, and, and she does lay out a lot of what these could be. Some people are, are trying to become more fit, get a new job, recover from uh, a, a cancer uh, scenario. You know, it, it could be all kinds of things. Uh, the loss of a loved one, like it could be a lot of things and the spectrum is wide of the stories that she has been uh, told on how people have used this system. So step one, select your challenge. Going into the following step, the second rule here, power-ups. Yep, collect power-ups. Which is exactly what you would expect it to be. (laughs) Like, what is it that gives you that little bit of a boost? As bookworms, we could easily say that, you know, taking time to sit down and read 15, 20 minutes or so in a day, like to me, that's a definite power up. If it's connecting with a friend or, you know, one of my girls, like those can all be power ups, but there are small things that you do to give you a, a short term boost to help you get through whatever the thing is that you're trying to become super better at. Again, exactly the way you would expect it to be. Yep. She defines power-up as any positive action that you can take easily that creates a quick moment of pleasure, strength, courage, or connection for you. Uh, The other thing that's interesting in this section is the whole idea of the emotion ratio, which 
is obviously tied to the the power ups because power ups make you feel good. But the number of positive emotions divided by the negative emotions is this emotion ratio. And we've kind of heard this before, but relationships and marriages specifically tend to thrive when their positive ratio is like five to one. And the closer you get to one to one, the more likely you are to separate or get divorced. And I'd heard that part before, but she also said in here that one to one is actually pretty close to clinical depression. And telling yourself to avoid negative emotions, which is typically the advice that people give someone who is dealing with this stuff, doesn't work. <laughs> you know, it's just stop feeling bad for yourself. It's not that simple. You have to create the more positive version of that. So I do think that the connection here is really interesting because if you can identify your power ups, you can use those as quick positive emotion boosts whenever you need them. And uh, I have an action item here to identify my power-ups. I've been thinking about this a little bit. I don't have them all identified. Have you thought about any of your power-ups? I have. You know, as I was going through this, I was thinking through, like, what are, like, what could some of these be? And maybe it'd be helpful just to share what I've got here. Uh, Because I have a handful. Uh, Like, write a thank you letter. Send a thank you email. Uh, <laughs> watch a YouTube video about puppies. <laughs> uh, snuggle my girls. Hug a friend. Do a short-term digital detox. Share my personal honest thoughts with a friend. Um, and then I've got a couple songs here that have a lot of meaning to me. That like Just sit down and listen to these songs. Like Those are some of the power-ups that I have written down. I've con- been continuing to add to that as I think about things. But that's that's my starting point. One of the ones that I've identified, which kind of made me mad, <laughs> <laughs> is uh, mindfulness meditation. Made you mad? That seems like a great power up because I struggle with it. I think as I'm thinking through this, the main thing that has caused me to not embrace that is this belief that I shouldn't need that, <laughs> you know, like I should, I should be able to do this on my own. I shouldn't have to rely on this, but when you frame it as a power up, it's kind of stupid not to do that <laughs> you know, five minutes <laughs> sure. a day and sure. all of the benefits that it gives you when you, I don't know, it's when I frame it as a power up, it's like, yeah, it isn't something that I, necessarily need to do. It's something that I want to do now. (laughs) And just framing it that way makes it a lot more sticky. Sure. And uh, I think that that's one for me. Another one would be getting coffee with a friend. I have kind of been lax in that, but I do recognize that those are the things that I really do enjoy. And I get so focused sometimes on all of the stuff I have to make and all the work I have to do and all the projects I'm involved with, that that's one of the things that can easily fall to the wayside. Now, so just to clarify something here, because like what you're saying, take grabbing coffee with a friend. Okay. It's not exactly a short, quick thing you can do. True. Like that's a longer thing. Um, We'll get into this, but I would venture to say that's more of a quest than it is a power-up. Could be. In the scheme of all of this. And I say that because uh, later on, she'll give us a way to keep score. And one of those is getting three power-ups in a day. Well, if you have something as, I I don't want to say big, but something, you know, larger in time commitment as like grabbing coffee with a friend, think about doing that three times in a day like that's pretty much your day that would be a pretty awesome day <laughs> it would be an awesome day yes yeah uh work might suffer somewhat <laughs> but yeah you know that's that's not not necessarily something i feel would it, it, it to me it's too big of a, a an item to be classified as a power-up but that might just me being getting me getting into the details there it could be i i thought about that because i When I was thinking about the power-ups, there are certain power-ups that are going to be 
bigger than others. Just like in any video game, you know, there's going to be something that gives you a little bit of health or something that gives you an extra life. You know, they're, they're not all going to be the, the same. For me, coffee with a friend, I'm going to drink coffee anyways. So really the sure. time investment here is probably about an hour max of social interaction. And the thing that got me thinking that way was at the end of this chapter, I think she talks about the social reflection power up where you think of three social interactions from your day. You respond to two prompts on a scale of one to 10. You answer, I felt closer to the other person or people, or I felt in tune with the other person or people. And then you repeat that for at least three days to see any benefit. As I was thinking about that, what are the situations where I do feel close to other people or feel in tune with other, other people I was picturing the situation where I would be able to answer tens for those. And that would be if I met somebody for coffee. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. So this social reflection power up, she's not specifically saying manufacture these interactions. She's saying reflect on these and answer the questions. I kind of took it a little bit different way where it was, how could I manufacture that? Because there have been days even in the last week where I did not have three social interactions in my day because <laughs> I was just yeah. laying on the couch. Right. So I couldn't even, you know, take this approach for uh, for those. But I don't know. That's just my my situation. But I think I would classify that as a PARP. I definitely see how you could uh, classify it as a quest, though, also. And it could float back and forth, too. I could see that. Yep. Like just yep. depending on, you know, how difficult things are for you lately. Yeah, I could see that. So... That's power-ups. What would be the opposite of power-ups? Bad guys. Bad guys. So, got to watch out for the bad guys. Yep. Obviously. Bad guys are basically anything that drives you further away from your goal. And I I haven't spent a whole lot of time like trying to classify what my particular bad guys are. The one I, I only have one written down at the moment, and that's a bad night of sleep. <laughs> like, okay, if I have a a bad night of sleep, what does that mean? Like, how do I battle a bad night of sleep? And that's that's the concept here. Is like you have to identify your bad guys, go to battle with them every day, and continue to try to get past them. I suppose if I stop and think through, like a what a lot of my uh, symptoms are that I could fight. You know, that's a lot of like fatigue, joint pain, mental fogginess and such. Like those are the specifics that I could be going after. And maybe those are what I need to classify as bad guys. Um, but there are some like specific things that can happen that are outside of me that I then need to go to war with, go to battle with. But identifying them and determining who are those and what are those you know, that's that's the core component of this particular piece. Yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this specifically. This is another action item I had was to identify my bad guys. But I know that one of the things that I've been struggling with recently is, I don't even know how to articulate this as a bad guy, but I get so focused on the tasks that I need to do, or not even that I need to do, the the things that I want to do in terms of getting things done that I don't recognize the opportunity to build the relationships in my day-to-day. That's been a big factor in my switch over to using the pen and paper and just making a simple list every day is I want to be more flexible and I want to be less connected to my plan for the day so that I can take advantage of the little moments to build the relationships throughout the day, if that makes any sense. Basically, I want to be more flexible. That's kind of what I wrote down as I was thinking through my new daily planning thing is I want to be able to flow with change. And for someone who is very logical and likes to plan things and scope everything out, and this is exactly what we're going to do, and that's hard for me to just say, yeah, let's just go with the flow. <laughs> sure. But uh, blessed are the flexible. They shall not be bent out of shape. That's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So you need to take a page out of my book because my whole day is like based on what happens when I get to work. <laughs> that's, yeah. It's pretty much what I do. 
because I like, terribly I can, inefficient, right? But yep, sometimes that doesn't matter, right? You know, sometimes there are things that are more important, and just where I am right now, that's what I need to focus on. Yeah, I, I think you know, not to you know go down bunny trails too far, but the the main thing that I've learned with that is just making sure that I have a plan that is able to fit in when I have gaps and learning to switch to and from it very quickly. Like that's, that's really it. Cause you know, if I, if you take like, for example, I was working at the church this morning, came home early to record this, but this morning like, I had a number of things that I was, that was on my list to get done today. Absolutely. None of them got done because I had so many things show up whenever I got there. Sure. Now, I also know like later in the week it's less likely for more things to show up because early in the week is when most of that stuff pops up. So I know I'll have time later on in the week to get to all of that. So I I just know that I'm going to have to flex across multiple days when things get done. Yeah, I'm not sure, you know, I think that's a bad guy for me, but I don't know how to articulate that necessarily Mr. too much structure. <laughs> That's that sure. my bad guy? <laughs> Maybe. Could be. I could see Doesn't that. Doesn't really line up with the uh the four supervillains that she articulated. She mentions the sticky chair, solitary confinement, uh the two-headed monster and the guilty twin, I believe is how she defined them. Yeah, she but, had uh, her own bad guys and she gave them all bad names. Yep. So <laughs> that's that seems to be pretty common across the book, which I I like that she did that. It it's it was really hard for me to embrace this concept of giving names to this stuff. Yep. It's like giving names to your power ups, giving names to your bad guys. Like just I struggled with that too. Go for it. I absolutely adore that you do this. It's fantastic. I don't think I'm gonna do that. Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I love that you do it and I love that other people do it. Like I just I it's not me. So yeah. That's the way it goes. All right, so give yourself a challenge, define your power-ups, define your bad guys, and then go on a daily quest. So every day you're determining what your quest for the day is and you're going to go after it. Uh, You know, if you think about how you go about games, like you have these smaller quests, like go collect this or go achieve that small piece, run the car through this particular course. Like you have these little quests that you go through. This is the same thing. Every day you need to set a quest for yourself and go after it. Go after achieving that. This is why I was saying, like, okay, something like going out for coffee could be qualified as a quest because it's kind of a bigger thing to go after. Yep. I like I, I don't know what some of these would be for me. In some cases, it could be something as simple as making sure I have my appointments in line. Um, it could be something like making sure I'm able to exercise for the day which maybe could be a power up. Like this is why I say it can sometimes float back and forth. It just kind of depends on the scale of these two of how big is it and how small is it? Does it qualify as a power up? Should it be a quest? You know, what is that? But essentially if you want to come back and boil it down to productivity terms, it's your daily goal. Like it's, it's your one MIT for the day is basically the way I saw it. Maybe that's a, 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 an incorrect way to say this or see it, but it's your goal for the day. That's that's my perspective. Yeah, I viewed this as the highlight from make time. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. So that's why I had trouble defining getting coffee with a friend for me as a quest. Because if I get coffee with a friend, I have not won the day. <laughs> sure. That's one small thing, but it's not ever going to be the main thing, unfortunately. It, that would be awesome if I got to that point where that was like the only <laughs> thing I had to do today. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But the quest that she talks about, exercise, for example, and uh, she talks about fun framing that. So instead of viewing it as I have to go to the gym because I want to lo- I want to lose weight, they view exercise as the reward itself instead of the hard work that can help you overcome procrastination. You don't view your quest as something that's going to take a ton of willpower to tackle and you kind of decide to pursue it for the pure enjoyment of the thing itself. And so exercise, again, that's something that I probably would not 
say is a quest for me, but I understand how it could be. Also from that section, though, this was interesting on page 232. She talks about how planning to have fun instead of trying to seek the rewards is actually a very powerful state of mind. When I read that, I thought of ultra learning and how that's basically the exact opposite, right? Because everything that you're doing in ultra learning is you're not there to have fun. You're there to challenge yourself and you should be doing that over and over and over again, right? So there's two different approaches here. And I guess I find myself really liking this gamification side of it. I Again, you know, not to go back and rehash ultra learning. I think that's very appropriate for certain people in certain situations. But I do think that this fun framing and just do a little bit every day, you know, win the day by designing these these quests. This is the uh, this is more like the advice that I would give pretty much anybody. Sure. <laughs> um, de- depending regardless of their their situation. I didn't like the section in here where she talks about smart goals. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like that. smart goals have been beaten to death, and uh, I do like the the questions that she asks. So about qu- about quest design, you know, is it specific? Is it realistic? Is it fun? Is it adaptive? Is it meaningful? I think those are those are pretty good. Uh, the real important ones out of there, I think, would be: is it meaningful? That's that's the one that kind of resonates with me. I want to make sure that the the stuff that I'm doing really does have meaning. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to change what I'm doing either. This is something I think that people misunderstand about the idea of passion. You don't just do what you're passionate about. You bring your passion to the thing that you're engaged in. I think it's Mike Rowe, Dirty Jobs, who said, don't follow your passion, but always bring it with you. You know, your perspective is the thing that can bring passion. So you can infuse meaning into the things that you're doing and maybe you want to change what you're doing. That's fine. But in the moment, like the way that you're going to get to the place where you can change what you're doing is to do it with all that you've got. And then the other thing that really resonates with me because I am terrible at this is, is it fun? You know, bringing more joy and having more fun in in my day to day. So once you've defined your quest for the day, like those three pieces, like, okay, the challenge is like the overall, but power-ups, bad guys, and quests, like that's the core of the game. But there's also some other aspects to it, the first of which is allies. Every time you get into, especially multiplayer games, it's super helpful to have your allies in the game. And they can help give you quests. They can give you, help you with power-ups. They can help you find the bad guys and battle them. Like They are by your side as you go through the game. Super better is no different. Like Having your allies and making sure that they understand the rules of the game and the terminology of the game, especially kids. Like Kids can make great allies because they love this stuff. Like, did you fight a bad guy today, Dad? Like That whole thing can go a long, long ways. But knowing who your allies are and helping them help you in the process of playing this game is is huge. I mean, being able to have friends along your side as you're going through this can go a very, very long way. So define your allies, help them help you. Yeah, and be a good ally to somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> There's a yeah. whole section in here on how to be an awesome ally, which I thought was good. But really, this is... If I were to reframe it, be a good friend and you'll get friends, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> to, to sure. be a, to to have friends, you have to show yourself friendly. Right. So that's really what this is all about. It can be hard sometimes to ask somebody for help, especially if you're dealing with something like the author was with the concussion. So I think a really interesting approach in this section is while it can be hard to ask someone for help, it's a lot easier to ask them to play a game. And playing a game with someone causes your stress levels to go down, it boosts your immune system, it makes your heart stronger, a whole bunch of other benefits. So framing it that way as I want to do this game, which is going to make me a better person, do you want to play it with me, is, I think, a, a good strategy to use. I also thought of the... um 
the Bookworm Club when I read this section because you just described it as once you decide on the rules that you're going to play by, then do it with other people, basically. I forget exactly how you said it. But the rules that we've defined for the podcast, other than when we get sick and we miss a week, (laughs) is read a book every two weeks, right? (laughs) And that's what we do. And everybody else who is doing that along with us, whether we talk to them or not, whether they're signed up for the Bookworm Premium membership or not, you know, they're playing the game with us. People who are listening to this, they're playing the game with with us. And so that's that's kind of cool. Uh, I thought when I when I read through this whole section on what an ally does and how to be a good ally, it's kind of cool how we can do that for people through the medium of podcasting. That articulates the benefits of podcasts that I have long believed are true in a much better way, I think, than I have ever done. <laughs> sure. And uh, it's just it's just kind of cool to, to think about it that way. Yeah, I like the club. I don't hang out there as much as I should. I should change that. I need to do that more. So allies, <laughs> you know, do you have your allies defined, Mike? Obviously, I feel like family is easy number one. Yeah, I don't have my allies identified per this, but I do have from, I forget which episode it was, I went through and I identified the relationships that I had. I'm not sure if you remember that. I do. You were uh, Joe plus plus. (laughs) Joe plus plus. That's right. I remember this. Yeah. So I forget exactly what that was from, but I do have that list. So I feel like I've kind of done that already. That's fair. That's fair. I'm with you on that. Like I have a, a handful of close friends have not asked anyone specifically to play the game with me yet because I'm trying to get all the details of it figured out to some degree, like how I want to go about doing that. But yes, needing to identify those allies. But part of that, and I want to know your take on this because this is the next piece down, is developing a secret identity. So whenever Jane McGonigal was going through her concussion, she gave herself the secret identity of Jane the Concussion Slayer. And... I chuckled when I read that. I mean, th- there are a lot of folks that gave themselves identities as, you know, in the stories that she shares. And I always like, hey, that's really cool. I don't think I want to do that. Like, that's not something I really yeah. resonate with. And then she gives this whole rationale on how giving yourself this alternative reality of sorts that can help you in the healing process. Like and the benefits of doing that, like yeah, I, I don't argue with you on any of that. I just don't like that idea. <laughs> Maybe this is me being an introvert. Maybe that's all that is. But that wasn't something that I found myself just anxious and excited to do. Again, I'm not a huge gamer, so maybe that's part of it. But this is this is one that I I like the concept, but I'm not sure I'm going to follow through on it. Yeah. Well. This uh, this was hard for me. My secret identity, I, I don't know. I, I was thinking through that, like, what's a, what's a superhero that kind of embodies what I want, the ideal behaviors that I want to change, basically. The only thing that came to mind was somebody like Stretch Armstrong, <laughs> you know, be more flexible. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And I had trouble making that personal. I don't think there's anything tied to that that I want to use to celebrate my secret identity the way that she describes it in this chapter, like creating a visual cue, adopting a mantra or a call to action, picking a theme song, sneakily showing it off, collecting heroic quotes, immersing yourself in the world of your hero, revealing your secret identity to someone you trust. That's not something that I really want to do, but I did find it interesting and I think helpful to picture that superhero because I just, I get this stretch Armstrong, like you grab the arms and you like pull them way, way apart, you know, and and then he like comes back to shape. Like that's what I want to be able to do. Yeah. (laughs) I want my day to be able to be completely blown up and just be able to go back to normal. Like nothing ever happened. That's the thing I'm really bad at. 
Sure. Because when stuff happens, I get frustrated that it happens and then I'm in this funk for like a day afterwards, right? I want to not have that happen. I want to be able to just flow in and out of the different things that I, I have to do, whether or not I had planned on on doing them. So I don't really have a secret identity that I want to embrace from this. And I don't have trouble even envisioning like flexibility like that as a heroic quality. Right. <laughs> but I know that's the thing for me now. And so I do credit the book with kind of showing me that. Yeah. I may still think through this one because again, it's a cool concept, I think. And one that like, I, I can see the benefits. I won't argue with that at all. And maybe this is just me being resistant to the work of going through that process and embodying a separate um, identity of sorts. Like I, maybe that's it's just me avoiding <laughs> very likely, but a thing I'll at least keep in mind. I think we'll see the last rule here. Epic wins and epic wins are, Think of it this way. You're putting together your daily quests. Say you have your daily quests and you string up a line of a hundred days in a row that you achieve your quest. That is an epic win. Or you have a marathon you're going to run at the end of your your challenge. That's an epic win. It's the big wins that are much bigger than a quest or a, a consolidation of a bunch of quests it's the achievement of something big. That's your epic win. And you can set goals. Basically, this this is where it starts to get flexible in how you want to play the game in that you can set goals that are long-term and shoot for those, and those become epic wins when you achieve them because they're bigger than a day. Like That can be your epic win. It can be a, a line of your quests, as I referred to, it could be a lot of different things. It's, it's just kind of up to you on how you want to to do that. But it's these bigger achievements in the midst of playing that game. I tried to come up with what some of these would be. Mike, the only one I really thought about was being able to say, yes, I'm past this mm-hmm. uh, disease and I'm past the infections and such. Like Being able to say I'm completely clear of that would be an epic win. But that's like I won the game sort of thing. (laughs) So yeah, it's kind of bigger yet than an epic win. So I haven't figured out what the smaller pieces of that would be. You know, I guess in my case, you know, as I'm talking about this out loud, it would probably be like going on trips or big family events and stuff and not having issues while I'm there. Sure. Being able to build up and, and develop the myself to where I don't have issues whenever I go on trips. I don't have to spend a week recovering from max stock when I get home. Like being able to do something like that would be a big deal. So maybe I just talked myself into some epic wins. (laughs) All right. You need to talk because I got to write this down. (laughs) Okay. So this section here, this one I had a little bit of trouble with because I think the goals, which she defines as quests, should really be epic wins. And that's probably because I'm approaching this through the 12-week year framework, personal retreat framework, where the things that you are going to put as your goals for the 12-week year, the whole idea there is that you're setting big yearly goals and then you're going to try to achieve them in 90 days, right? So I think those would qualify as epic wins. And you mentioned running a marathon. That's actually something, well, half marathon, That's that was an epic win for me. And uh, it was actually an epic win twice because the first time I did it, I hurt myself. And then I had to (laughs) set the goal again, you know, and do it the right way. But now that I've done that, I don't really think that really qualifies as an epic win anymore. So it's kind of interesting how this stuff evolves. Maybe the next half marathon that I run, that is just a, a quest and not an epic win. But I don't know. I, I kind of think when it comes to doing something new, um, as an example, that it's kind of maybe too granular to think of the the quests and the and the epic wins. I, I think you kind of have to start with the epic win, and like I said, that's really the goal. And then the quests are maybe the the habits, the milestones, sort of a thing that you have to you have to do in order to to get there. 
But I do agree with some of the philosophy behind this, where you do want to be able to measure whether you are uh, on track to achieve these, and you do want it to be something that you're not 100% po- positive that you can achieve. That's kind of the distinction she makes, is that if you know 100% that you can do something, then it's a quest. It's not an epic win. Because the role of the epic win is to shoot for breakthrough. But I would argue that if you're setting goals that you're 100% positive you can achieve, then you're probably just setting too small goals. You know, a different way of saying the same sure, thing. you're not shooting high enough. Right, exactly. But... Yeah, I, I I like the whole idea of the epic wins. Uh, I don't think I have anything specific right now that I want to label as an epic win publicly, but I do have a couple things that fall into this category for me. And uh, again, you know, I have trouble thinking of it in terms of quest versus epic wins, but I do have some things that are big goals for me. Um, based on my own framework. Sure. Well, keep in mind, quests are to be completed within 24 hours. She does put that limitation on the quest side of it. True. I don't know if that helps here or not. It does. Although, what about all the things then that you are 100% positive you can achieve, but they're going to take longer than that? Where do those fall? Yeah, I don't know. And Where do you want them to is fall? there even a reason to do those things? <laughs> a baseline win. It's not an epic win. It's a baseline win. I guess. Yeah. Like we uh, were on episode 79, right? So record episode 100. Is that an epic win? I'm 100% positive we can do that as long as we don't decide that, you know, this is pointless, <laughs> which I don't think is happening. Um, I guess me personally, like I would feel like that's 100. I'm 100% positive we can, we can get to episode 100, right? Right. right. I, do th- I do think that feels like an epic win, but... According to this definition, maybe it's not, you know? I don't know. I I think there's some flexibility in how you define some of it by design. Like, if if you feel that it's an epic win, go for it. Like, and, and call it an epic win. And, Mike, maybe what you feel is an epic win is something much bigger. I think, because me personally, I feel like hitting 100 episodes for Bookworm, like, to me, that would be an epic win. Yep. Because it's still a lot of work between here and there. I could say no, and it could like we could cancel the show. I have no you could interest pick in that. Plan of the Cave Bear next time, and then we're done. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So whoever gets that message to me first, please don't do that because I don't want Mike to cancel the show. But I don't. I have zero interest in dropping Bookworm, but it is an option on the table at all times. True. You know, anything you do, any project, anything you've got, like you can always say no to it. Uh, should you? Probably not in some cases. With something like Bookworm, it's not 100% mandatory for our incomes. It's easier to say no to it. Neither one of us want to do that. Right. But that means that getting to episode 100 does take some work and does take some commitment. So to me, I would still say that's an epic win. Like, sure. It's a goal to shoot for. I would call it that. You may not because you feel like it's 100% in the bag already. Well, I like the way you defined it not too long ago of something that you're excited to achieve. I think that's a better definition of an epic win than it's not something you're 100% positive you can you can achieve or it's a certain length of time. If you're super excited about it and it's big, call it an epic win and sure. be done. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it anymore. Yeah. For sure. Uh, one piece of all of this that I, I want to talk about somewhat, because I'm curious your take on it, is how to keep score. I don't know of any game that doesn't have some scorekeeping mechanism. Like, m- maybe it's a board game of sorts, but you always have a way to win. Yep. Like, it, if you have a game that you can't win, like, or you can't accrue points in some form... People just don't play it. <laughs> like it's all borderline, yeah. not even a game. So what is the scorekeeping formula for this? And she does have a formula uh, on how to get wins. Mm-hmm. And that is on a daily basis, if you get three power-ups in one day, you battle one bad guy in a day, and you achieve your quest in a day. So three power-ups, one bad guy, one quest, all of those equal a daily win. 
So you win the day if you've done those five things, the three power-ups, the bad guy, and the quest. Over time, you can accrue a string of daily wins, and that could be you know, a, a, a record in itself. You can track your your personal records, like most power-ups in a day, the most bad guys you've fought in a day, your longest daily win streak. Like You can start tracking all of that. Basically, having some way of accruing the numbers around all of this I think is what the intent of the app was. Yeah. I didn't dig into it a whole lot. I downloaded it, glanced at it, and thought, this is ugly. I'm not going to do this. That was my sum total experience with the app. So I can't say I recommend going that route. I'm sure many people do with great success. Not for me. Um, so I will likely build out a spreadsheet somewhere uh, for this. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. But that's... That's the process of keeping score. Obviously, you're going to want to do something in order to help with that because having those numbers visible at all times is also going to be helpful just as somebody who does data stuff uh, or has in the past. like That, to me, is always important. So keeping score, the three power-ups, a bad guy, and a daily quest equals a daily win. Yeah, I don't know what to do with this. I initially thought, and I have it in my outline, to set up the super better system myself inside of my task manager. Sure. But as a, the more I think about it, the more distance that I get from reading this, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> sure. So the power ups I think would be fairly easy. In fact, I think an easier way to track those might be something like hab- habitify. Is that how you say it? There's this habit tracking app Habitica. It's uh, where you create actually an avatar when you set it up and then you've got habits, you've got dailies, you've got to do's, which are basically like the quests in this sense. And it's a social habit tracker. So you can form parties and the more that you follow through and check off the habits that you have in there, the more experience you get and the more health you you get and you get different abilities, different levels. It's basically like an RPG for the habits that you want to create or bad habits that you want to break. I feel like that's as far as I would ever possibly want to take something like this. I don't really think what marking a a daily win versus a non-daily win really makes a lot of sense to me. Like, so if you're going to follow this formula, basically, you do your three power-ups, you battle your bad guy, but you don't complete your quest. You mark that as a failure then? Like this, it seems like you're, you're either win or you lose with this method. But I think that habit formation as the foundation for creating the life that you want to live, there's a lot of gray area there. And if you do 80% of this, you maybe did pretty good. And ideally you want to you know, do one thing and then once you've mastered that, you add another thing and another thing and another thing. I think uh, the three power-ups plus one bad guy plus one quest is too formulaic for me. And uh, I do think that keeping score is definitely a good idea. And whether you choose to use the super better system or you just choose to start building positive habits tracking them is a very good idea. But I don't think I'm going to keep score her way. And I'm definitely not going to keep track of the four personal records that she says to keep track of. Your most powerful hour, your most powerful day, your most epic battle day, and your longest daily win streak. I have the most powerful hour. hour, I view that as like a biological prime time. I've actually got that outlined on my daily planning sheet that I use inside of GoodNotes. But there's no data associated with that. It's just anecdotally, this is what I've noticed. And I think that's the thing that causes the most friction for me from this book is I tend to notice these things generally. And when you're talking about a game, you're keeping score, you have all of the data right there. It's interesting because you're talking about the spreadsheets and things like that. Maybe your brain is wired where you tend to think this way more than than I do. I tend to just like, I see these general observations and so I'm going to 
change something, right? Yeah. I, I think with for me, like I, the numbers do help. You know, she does call out that having like you can change the formula, but I I feel like she needed to give you some formula. Like it'd be a little weird if she didn't. she did. Yep, definitely. So I I think I get your point, and I'm I'm quite certain that this particular formula is not for everyone. I, I'm with you in that because you're right. If you get three power ups, beat your bad guy for the day, or multiple bad guys. Like take that example. Say you got five power ups beat four bad guys, but you didn't achieve your quest. Like you went over and above on the first two, but missed the last one. And that's still a loss. Yeah. Like, I, I, I could definitely see how you, how you do that or, or get to that point. So I, I get your point, Mike, as a numbers person and someone who loves the data side of it, like that could be helpful. I'm not usually one that wants to do like the whole, quantified self thing but i do think that the quantified self piece can get to be super helpful if you're dealing with something very targeted like if you're dealing with a disease or you're dealing with a cancer or a health issue makes perfect sense in my mind it's when everything is 100 percent healthy and and people tend to use that as a way to ignore what's going on with themselves. Like that's when I start to have an issue. Like people who don't pay attention to their heart rate because their watch does it like that doesn't make sense to me. (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah, you're you're outsourcing something you should pay attention to. What happens if your watch, you know, what if happens if the battery is dead for a week for whatever reason, like, and then all of a sudden your heart rate spikes and you don't notice it. Like, well, (laughs) you've trained yourself to not pay attention to that. But if you're not healthy, you you may not even be able to notice that stuff and you have a tendency to need some of the quantified self pieces that data in order to help you become aware of it uh and even if you're healthy like if you're going to use it in that way i could see it i wouldn't use it indefinitely like just using it for the rest of my life that's not something i think i will ever do but right now given the state of how i'm doing i can't see like I can't see multiple days out right now as to how things impact what's going to happen in five days. Because I know like if I do something like record bookworm on an afternoon, I know it has an impact on the next two days, but I can't tell you in what way. You can't quantify it? I can't. I can't see yeah. it. It's too abstract. I know that something's happening, but I can't tell you what. And like trying to do the whole keeping score process, I feel like could be an avenue to get an understanding on it. I would have to keep notes on those days as well in order to to see it. But I, f- my sense is that this particular formula, although it may not be a hundred percent, is at least a good starting point. Mm-hmm. I feel it's at least something I can start with. I'm, I, I say all this and you probably got the impression I'm going to do this, but I'm actually not convinced I'm going to. Um, This is an interesting concept and one that's deeply fascinating to me. And it's especially since I have a health issue I'm trying to work through. Like to me, that's the perfect case scenario to do something like this, but I'm not a hundred percent convinced on how it's going to work. Some of that is because I don't have, all of the bad guys defined. I don't know what these quests are going to look like. Uh, I don't a hundred percent have it nailed down as to who all of my allies are going to be. Like I don't have any of that nailed down yet, which is why the one and only action item I have is to build out my super better game. And if that means I get to a point where keeping score makes sense, I'll do it. Uh, but I'm not a hundred percent that that's going to happen quite yet. I, but I won't know until I get to that point. Hopefully this is something you can follow. Like mint, like this is a crazy, (laughs) crazy way of coming at this, but hopefully it's understandable. Well, I think I am keeping score, just not the super better way. So for example, talked about how I changed the way that I plan my day. I've got my three things. Those I would argue are probably my three quests for the day. I'm not choosing a bad guy to battle, but I also am tracking my habits inside of streaks. And this is interesting because you're talking about the quanti- the quantified self stuff. 
everybody that I have known that has really just gone all in with quantified self stuff, they get so obsessed with tracking all those little things and they lose sight of like the big things (laughs) that they need to be doing. And then they've got all this data and they find themselves not able to accomplish their goals still, right? Because they're so focused on just gathering all of this data. And uh, I really like streaks. I've been playing with it since Rose told me about the integration with shortcuts. You can create automations. So I have one, for example, when I go into my Bible app in the morning, that's kind of like a power up for me, I guess. That to do my daily Bible reading, that marks the streak as completed and or the habit as completed in streaks. You can tie it to your uh, your mindfulness minutes inside of Apple Health. So something like Headspace, for example, if I were to meditate in the morning, that gets marked then as a mindfulness minutes inside of, of streaks for the amount of time that I spend inside of the app. And uh, I've gotten a lot better at tracking my habits that way because it happens automatically. I don't have to think about it. That's always been the thing that has caused it to break in the past is for a while, you know, I'll go into my a separate habit tracking app and I'll mark things as completed. But then I forget one day my chain's broken and now all the motivation's gone, right? To keep going with it. So automating that stuff has helped a lot. And uh, I think, you know, if I were to, to just real briefly articulate the way that I'm keeping score, it's tracking my daily habits inside of the habit tracker and then tracking the three things that I'm trying to do in a day in the, my paper paper list. Go paper. Yep. Paper for the win. All right, you ready for part three? This will be fast. Adventures. If you can't figure out what you should do to like what your super better challenge should be, she gives you three potentials and gives you a bunch of quests, helps you identify your power-ups and bad guys for those challenges, and you're off to the races. So basically, she has three different super better games that you can play if you don't have or want to set one up on your own. She yep, gives it to you. Three of them that are canned, right? Yep. I looked at these. I didn't like any of them. Yep. <laughs> so I <laughs> didn't do any of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm of course not doing any of them. Uh, I, I read through like some of the titles on the quests and stuff. I didn't read through all the detail on it uh, because it's uh, not going to do it. So just yep. skipped over that. But the the three different adventures are Love Connection, Ninja Body Transformation, and Time Rich. The first, just what you'd expect, building a love relationship. Uh, the second is your health, your fitness uh, adventure, as you would expect. And the third is how to get more time in your days. So basically there's one for pretty much everybody there. I think some of the idea there is just, you know, Make it possible for anyone and everyone to get at least one. Uh, Again, I'm not picking any or all of those. So if you need help coming up with what this should be and you feel you're not creative enough to develop some of this on your own, I guess you could pick from those. I I didn't really feel that... It's a super better quick start. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. That's a good way to say it. Like It's the, the cheat sheet, if you will for getting moving on this, but I don't feel like power ups, bad guys and quests are that hard to define. Uh, I, I think it maybe gets a little bit harder if you want to do like a secret identity, which give, take it or leave it. But anyway, if you want the quick start guide, it's there, it, it will help you get going. And maybe you can use that as a way to help you define some of the other pieces. Maybe I'll skim back through it as a way to try to get ideas. Uh, but I'm not going to follow it you know, as it is. Yep. All right. Action items. Hit me. You got three. I do. So I mentioned these all already, but I want to play more games with my family, play with purpose. I put it in the outline as family game night, but that doesn't mean we're playing games on a specific night every week. Just something that I want to do more intentionally. Also, I want to identify my power-ups. talked about a couple of them, but I do want to think through a complete list and identify my bad guys. I feel like I really haven't done this 
very well yet. And I think this could be beneficial. I just have the one of build out the super better game for myself. I, I yeah, think the I guess I didn't I didn't put that because I'm not all in with the formula she outlines. Yeah, so I and just that picked could be. pieces of it. <laughs> yeah, I I think the pieces like when I say build out the game, I mean like I I know what the challenge is. I know most of my power ups, but I, I'm essentially saying I want to identify power ups, identify bad guys, identify a few quests, um, formally invite my allies. And maybe keep score. Like when I say build out the game, that's what I mean by that, to put some more teeth to it. Sure. So uh, style and rating, this is going to be hard. Um, I love her style. She's easy to read. Uh, The way they formatted the book made it super simple to understand, like what is a quest? Because she spells out quests and and such through the whole book. And that I, I, I love the way that she formulated the entire book and outlined it, et cetera, et cetera. The stories are super helpful. Um, love that. As far as rating goes, this is, it, it's hard because you're essentially rating a game, which is the core of the whole book, but I haven't played the game. <laughs> so it's like trying to rate something you've not done is what it feels like, which I'm not trying to cop out. I'm uh, what I'm getting at is like, it's, it's kind of hard for me to say how I would rate and recommend this book, not knowing the outcome of it, because this is like, it, it's like reading the cover and then trying to say what you think about it. Like, uh, I got the intro. I, I get the concepts. Uh, they seem uh, valid for the most part. So I I don't struggle with that. Um, so all of that said, if I take it just as a book, like what the content of this is and what she says and how she says it, like it's it's a very good book. I think it's one that if some folks are a little more open minded in how you can use mindsets in a healing process, I would recommend this to them. I can't tell you if I would recommend the super better game or not. Um, so just as a book, as a concept of using mindsets and using a gameful approach to achieving something like a goal or a challenge of sorts that you're giving for yourself, I, I'll put it at a 4.0, mostly because I don't know <laughs> the other side of it. Um, but I don't feel like it's a bad book by any means. So I don't want to go too low with it. So I'm kind of in this weird spot. So I'm going to put it at a 4.0. Again, I think if you're open to using mindsets in a gameful approach to uh, achieving a goal, this is one to go to. I do like it for that. Cool. Uh, what I what this book reminded me of when I looked at the Super Better app was when we read Work Clean, I think that was Dan Charnas, and we got all yes. excited about that. And then we looked at the app and we're like, this hasn't been touched in years. That's yes. kind of the effect that I had with this book. And it was kind of disappointing, to be honest, because I really enjoyed the book itself. When I started reading the book, I got super excited about the Super Better system. And at first, I'm a little bit apprehensive about it. And like, well, it's probably not going to be that great. Then she talks about like the 400,000 people that are doing it, whatever. And like, okay, I need to check this out. And then I go to download it from the App Store and it just looks like garbage. That was too bad because she does a great job of telling the stories. She does a great job of citing all of the research. I mean, there's tons and tons of research in this book, which is really, really interesting because you mentioned it near the beginning. You kind of are force fed stuff. You hear things basically about how bad video games are for you. And she has a whole bunch of data that shows that maybe that's not really true, <laughs> right? So just how yeah. it kind of shifted my perspective on like how how you can use these things. And just because they exist doesn't mean, or just because they can be used negatively doesn't mean that the tool itself is necessarily bad. And it kind of challenged me to to rethink how I want to use this intentionally to achieve the the desired results. I really enjoyed her style. 
I read through this book pretty quickly, to be honest. Um, I did not go through it the way that you're supposed to because there are quests along the way. I think she calls them quests in within the book. Yes. There's yep. like 80 of them or something like that. And I didn't do a single one <laughs> because they that would have made the book take significantly longer to go through it that way. So if you were to do it the way that she outlined it, maybe you get a different uh, a different outcome too. You know, that's that's worth calling out right here that, you know, we didn't do it technically the right way. But I I really like the the book. I really like the ideas that she shares in here. I really like her story and how she shares that she's been able to overcome stuff. It's kind of hard to argue with stuff like that, you know. So if you approach it as what pieces of this can I take and modify, which is kind of what I do every time that I read a book. I think there's a lot here. I wouldn't recommend it going in and saying like, here's a, here's a system now follow the system. But if you can get past that, I think there's a a lot of good stuff here. I'm going to join you at 4.0. I feel like this is a really long book and you do have to put in some effort to get the good ideas out of here, but it's a worthwhile read. As long as you can go into it with an open mind and be flexible in how you're going to apply the principles and not try to just do it, you know, the way that she recommends it. I I really do wish there was a better tool or, or app or system that was connected to it. If the app was better, maybe this is a 4.5, but it's almost like the content is so good. And then because it's connected to the app, that's a reflection of the content in the book too. So you you read the book and you get excited about the app and then you look at the app and you're like, well, this hasn't received any TLC in a long time. It kind of devalues the the ideas in the book, in my opinion. Not that it necessarily even should, but that's the impression that you get when you look at it. It's like, oh, maybe these ideas aren't so... so um, earth shattering, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're not, not so great because look at this thing. It's, it's not so great, you know? So I kind of wish that those were disconnected. Well, speaking of long books, what's next, Mike? (laughs) The next book is even longer and it is principles (laughs) by, by Ray Dalio. Although I'm probably about halfway through this and it's a really interesting read and it's going a lot quicker than I thought it would because a lot of the pages just have like one sentence on them and it's in big yeah. letters. So it's an interesting book. I've read it before. I'm going through it again at the moment. I'm excited about to uh to talk through this one with you. It'll be a, a fun fun episode for sure. Following principles, we actually have kind of a special book. Uh it's called You Are Awesome by Neil Pasricha. Hopefully I got your name right, Neil. Um we actually have these uh advanced readers editions in this case. You know how we always tease about like these random fiction books wanting us to review their book. Well, we actually had somebody with a nonfiction book want us to do that. And I agreed. So we they sent us a couple of and these. More importantly, it looked like a good book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was reading through some of it and and had some questions and such. I was like, you know what? I I am genuinely interested in this one. So they sent us a couple. And uh, as odd as this is, they sent us these a little while back. It's just, it just hasn't fit real well. Um, so we're going to be covering that one two books from now. But you can actually pre-order that one right now, and it comes out November 5th. So you can get this still and read along with us because um, it will be out by the time we actually get through get through it. So just making that aware, it was sent to us, but... Super excited about that one because it looks really interesting. So there you go. You Are Awesome by Neil Pasricha. Hopefully I'm getting your name right, Neil. (laughs) Uh, You got any gap books, Mike? I have a potential gap book, which I may or may not get to, but it is Stillness (laughs) is the Key by Ryan Holiday. I am very excited to dive into this one. Yeah, that one's been on pre-order for a while too. That's brand, brand new, right? Just within the last few weeks, right? Yep. Yeah, he's kind of been making the rounds lately on the TV shows and the podcasts and things. Right. But I was a big fan right. of The Obstacle is the Way. I did not actually read Ego is the Enemy, which was his other book. But 
I feel like I know what to expect from Ryan Holiday, and I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. I do not have a Gap book, primarily because Joe has been sick, and I know better, and Mike picked a long one. So I'm going to read Principles by next time. (laughs) I'm going to be content with that. All right. (laughs) So that's where I'm at on that. Now, going back to how we pick books, again, send me a private message if you're a member. I will check. Uh, on the Bookworm Club, so bookworm.fm slash membership. Go there, become a member, send me a private message on the club, club.bookworm.fm, with what book you want us to read next. I just am envisioning all of these scenarios where this could go very poorly. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong. But it could be fun. It could be <laughs> it very could be fun. fun. So send me a private message with what book you want us to cover. All right. And if you're joining us, then pick up Principles by Ray Dalio. And we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>